This is a podcast about the hardcore community. Made by and for those who live authentic lives and embrace hard truths. We archive the stories of the bands and people who make this lifestyle possible. I'm Josh Lyon. And I'm Greg Benoit. And this is the Hardcore Archive Podcast. Welcome to episode 152 of the Hardcore Archive Podcast. I'm your host, Josh Lyons. With me, as always, is Greg Benoit. Uh, tonight, we're going to be talking with Nate from Hereditary, uh, one of my favorite records from last year. So I'll be stoked to talk to him about that and the process and everything. And I recently realized that we share a common interest in other kinds of music. So I'll be really curious to talk to him about all that, too. Uh, but well, before we do that, uh, give us a rating and a follow on your preferred streaming platform. Uh, give us a follow on all your social medias. Instagram is at Enterprise Hardcore and at Hardcore Archive Podcast. Find out about in, uh, uh, episodes, shows, all sorts of other cool shit on there. Uh, other than that, I got a show coming up. I'm pretty sure when this episode airs, it'll be right around that time. Uh, Saturday, January 27th in Rochester. Uh, Edict, Pure Bliss, Coalition, uh, Wreath of Tongues, and like uh, Fatal Visions, uh, like one or two other bands. California Brew House, 7 p.m. Hope to see everybody there if you're listening in this area. Uh, but yeah, like I said, tonight we're going to be talking with Nate uh, from Hereditary. Uh, but before we do that, let's uh, uh, Greg jump on. How you doing tonight, Greg? Oh, hey, Josh. I'm doing good. Um, we're like freezing here in Rochester. And I understand, Nate, you're in, in San Diego, right? Yes, yeah, sir. Sunny, sunny. Right. <laughs> so what, like, what's the temperature right there? Because this morning it was like seven degrees. Oh, that's not fun. Um, yeah, I wake up here and it's 40 and it's like something to complain about. Yeah, so, no, 40, 40 sounds nice right about now. Although it's yeah. like, not like beach weather. So you'll have, I guess, I guess it's not perfect there either. Yeah. We're used to seventies, eighties. Yeah. When I was, when I was like in middle school, I had this like fantasy that I was going to move to San Diego. Cause that was like right around the time that like Blink-182 released Dude Ranch. <laughs> and, um, I just like imagined it being like. 72 degrees year round everybody's like hanging out on the beach um so you've ruined that fantasy for me like 30 years after the fact there you go i remember going to vegas like uh, it was probably about 10 years ago around christmas time and it was about that temperature there at that time we were surprised that it, got, it gets that cold there too so um but yeah like i said uh getting into the music aspect of it uh uh, I stumbled upon the Hereditary release last year, and obviously, as you know, I, I thoroughly enjoyed that. And then, you know, recently, uh, I, I I happened to realize that you uh, create like hip hop beats and stuff like that. So, you were obviously somebody I was interested in having on the podcast eventually. But once I kind of put two and two together, I was like, oh man, this would be cool to to get this dude on soon. So I'm kind of glad we uh got this shit going. Oh, yeah, um, so like I told you, we usually kind of ask people about like their their upbringing hardcore first, but being that you kind of have a little bit more musical interest that I'm interested in talking about, I kind of want you kind of to tell us just about the whole thing, like how you got started with music and like what your first interests were in music as like a youth and shit like that. You know what I mean? No, sure. Um, music has always been like kind of a part of my childhood. Uh, my grandpa played guitar. Uh, my dad's best friend played bass and music was always playing in the house growing up and stuff. So I kind of heard it all. Um, my dad was super into like skate punk, uh, everything from like reggae to hip hop. That was where I got a lot of my hip hop influence from. Um, but I didn't really start like picking up the guitar or anything. Like they were always around or whatever. I would always like try to make noise however I could. But um, I didn't really pick up a guitar um, until like my sophomore year of high school, I think. I started taking like a guitar class and I was like, you know, I can kind of start using this thing now. Um, but, you know, before that, I started making beats and stuff. Um, yeah, man. I mean. <laughs> so, like, your dad was into skate punk. Did he, like, get you into, like, any kind of punk music or hardcore or anything hardcore adjacent? Um, it, it was playing in the car. I probably didn't realize it at the time. But, um, you know, we were always yeah. going to the skate park every weekend. So, like, he would always just try to throw something on to try to get us. All right. Well, I got some new dad goals because, like, Going to the skate park with my kids sounds pretty cool. They're like a little bit young for the skate park, but I'm I'm just uh, excited to hear that because, you know, I try to get my kids into punk and like they aren't having any of it. They they're like the best I can do is ska right now. <laughs> it's, 
It's more punishment for me. I'm not really into ska. <laughs> so ever since I, I, I found your band and such, I kind of have an estimate that you guys are maybe like early 20s. Is that about is that about right? Or Yeah, I turned 20 last May. OK, so let's kind of talk about the musical upbringing then like a little more thoroughly, like like listening to like rap and punk and stuff. You it sounds like you would have come up with music in like the early 2010s ish era. Like. How's finding music aside from having relatives that like it? Is it all like digital, like YouTube? Like, because we've interviewed uh, mostly people that are like 30s and 40s. And we always kind of wonder like how people find music in the modern age. And I think you're one of like two or three people in this age bracket in the last couple of years that we've interviewed. So sure. I'm I'm definitely fascinated to, to dive into this a little bit. No, I, I definitely like was kind of born into like the streaming era, you know, um, me and like a lot of other kids my age was that's just how we find music. Um, luckily, I also just have a bunch of cool older relatives who know a bunch of cool music who then I can go to Spotify and be like, oh, there we go. It's going on my playlist. But um, a, a lot of it was just word of mouth with friends and stuff, too. Um, that gets it around. But besides that, just streaming services. Uh, YouTube was a big thing, you know, just like music videos. Um yeah, the radio. <laughs> I mean, I just I imagine not to shit on the age group, but I imagine like a lot of younger kids finding like a lot of crappier like rap and stuff. But you seem to like have more of a inter common interest with the kind of shit that I like, as well as like you seem more like uh, schooled on like classic music, too. Like I can tell from the, the beats that you're making and stuff like so it's just cool to see people in your age group not like, like paying attention to classics and shit. You know what I mean? Sure, like, is yeah. that something that's in, like, your whole circle of friends, too, or? Yeah, I think it's much more, um, like, widely accepted now amongst, I, like, Spotify makes it super easy to, like, dig into that type of old stuff, because it's not, it's not, like, based on time anymore. It's just thrown in a playlist. So, like, if it's a certain vibe, if it matches a certain vibe, people are going to find it eventually, and it's... <laughs> People, people enjoy it now. A lot of my friends do. But I definitely remember in high school listening to the type of stuff that my dad would put me on and friends being like, what is that shit? Like, go listen to this or whatever. And it's just like the trap beats or whatever. And like, I can enjoy that, but this is not what I, I really love, you know? So, yeah, because I feel like even when Greg and I were in high school, like we would have been coming up on like punk and stuff. But like even like the soul and like the real classic shit that like you obviously are knowledgeable about, like I didn't even come up on a lot of that shit till i was like older like an adult you know what i mean so like having like all that knowledge like are you listening to music like all the time and shit too then or oh yeah yeah i, I mean i gotta have something to fill the void but a lot of it too just as a producer like you're looking for samples constantly or at least i am so that helps me find a lot of like old soul and jazz that i've end up loving um yeah just lots lots of digging in the crates <laughs> And I'm guessing you're like me too. Then, like my girlfriend, sometimes she'll be like, "What's going on?" And we'll be like at a restaurant. I'll be like, "This is where Action Bronson got this fucking beat from." I, I just realized, you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, and because like some of this classic shit, I'm not as schooled on. And I'll hear it in a restaurant, I'm like, "Oh," and and she's like, "You don't know who this is?" And I'm like, "Well, I know who the rapper is that used it or whatever." You know what I mean? So, um, but like when like so then when did you start getting more into hardcore like was that was it were they kind of like one and the same like hip-hop and hardcore or did that come a little later like i know you had the uncle and the relatives but um i started going to my first show i was like 13 um uh, my cousin and a group of his friends brought me it was like i think the lineup was take offense this band pso um who else played a couple other like chula vista hardcore bands at the time and um i was there just like hanging around my cousin was like you're coming we're gonna f like you're gonna end up liking this shit like let's just go and um it was something i'd never seen before and i think that like uh shock factor was like what got me into it and i was like i need to see more of this because you're 13 like still trying to figure out what you like so this it was like a perfect segue um and I'm super thankful that I have my older cousins to have guided me in the right direction because I don't know where I'd be today without hardcore. But that that show was huge in my like, holy shit, like this is what I want to do. <laughs> yeah, Greg, I think we have a lot of common uh, answers like that where it's like it's a it's kind of a scary 
uh, setting in the first few shows you go to, but that's kind of what attracts us to it and kind of keeps us going the first couple of years. Like, even when we're like, like younger, like as Nate said, 13 or in our case, like 15 or 16 or whatever it was. And everybody else is like in their twenties and some of them are pretty fucking big. Yeah. And now, now you got people with the face tattoos and tattoos everywhere. So it's like, man, where are these dudes coming from? You know? So, yeah, I think 13 is like the perfect age. Uh, 13, 14 is like the perfect age to get into hardcore. And like definitely seeing that first pit is like pretty wild. I think for me, I like one of my friends had a skate video that had like footage of like hardcore and punk bands in it. And so I kind of had some idea of what it was going to be like from that uh, skate video. Um, but seeing it in person is like the real deal. Um, so like I, I just have a, a question and, and if I'm jumping ahead, I apologize, Josh, but like, um, you seem like you, you've played like a number of shows that are more like of the beat down variety. Um, like, uh, what's, uh, what's like the local scene like in, uh, San Diego is, is like beat down pretty big over there or is it like a mix of, uh, different types of hardcore? I think San Diego is like at a perfect point right now where there is a bunch of different type of types of hardcore. Um, I think that like, it used to be pretty beat down, you know? Um, I remember that was a lot of the shows that I ended up going to like 2019, um, obviously pandemic hit. And then like those shows after the pandemic were like kind of more like beat down. And then you had like the punk shows or whatever that were getting thrown in like local sewers. Cause like venues weren't open and stuff. So it, it was definitely a mixed bag and it still is. Um, the Che is thriving still. There's still a very uh, big group of kids who want to make all types of different music. And that excites me. Um, obviously, Beatdown can get a uh, little, little too, uh, I don't know, just like straightforward, you yeah. know? So pe people just like, as I did, you know, had my Beatdown era. I was like, mm -hmm. I like this for six months. And then I, I think I'm on to, I think I'm on to new things. Well, I, I saw you. Uh, I, uh, I saw very, you. Sorry, continue. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. I think that's like like the entryway right now is kind of like the beatdown path. People are seeing the videos. People are seeing the mosh pits on the TikToks and the Instagram reels and stuff, and they're like, "It's the shock factor again." They're like, "Whoa, what is this?" And beatdown and heavy hardcore just happens to be the entryway right now. You know. Yeah, yeah. We meet a lot of people who like you know they get into it through like tsunami or something. Exactly. Um, and then they kind of like brought in their their tastes from there. I saw you guys opened for um, Missing Link, uh, which is a band that has kind of a Rochester connection where we're based out of. Uh, I've known Mike for a hot minute. Um, so it's, it was cool to see, uh, you know, see like a local connection uh, uh, when I was checking out your Instagram, listening to some of your music, uh, getting ready for this interview. Sure, yeah. No, that set was huge. Talk about good beat down, though. Whew. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, they like got real popular real quick. So I'm like super happy for him because he's like a, a pretty chill dude, even though his music is like some of the most aggressive hardcore that's uh, on the market th to today. That's awesome. Yeah, shout out to Missing Link. We got to get you guys back up in Rochester, though. They've only played here once, like when they first started. I know Pain and Truth's out there doing their thing. So we'll make it happen eventually. Um, one one other thing I'm thinking too, because you mentioned the punk thing, is you mentioned your first show was, was Take Offense. Like, are they pretty big? I know Chula Vista, that's like right outside San Diego, or that's pretty, technically a part of San Diego, right? Or yeah, yeah, it's 15 minute drive for me. Yeah. So are they pretty are they pretty big in that area or oh yeah, yeah. No, every time they throw something, like people show up. Um, I think that's like just kind of the status that they're at within the city. You know, they gain their respect, they're here to stay, you know, and they stick around. They all go to shows, like all of their members are still actively involved and are booking shows in San Diego and stuff. So it's it's really cool to see um so i know uh like i say we'll talk a little bit more about the beats and stuff but were there any other bands uh before we get into hereditary that you were a part of or anything or um i had like a little thing in middle school that didn't go anywhere it was just like me and my buddies um i played in a band called pessimista with my buddy sergio and then a few other members that were me and Sergio were the only like main members. I think every other show had a different member playing a different instrument. So that was that. Um, but that, that was a good run. Um, but now we're just doing Hereditary. And then I play bass in a punk band called Intercom. 
Oh yeah, I saw you had that tag down there too. Is that a, is that band you joined more recently, or have you, have you been in that band the whole time? Or yeah, so that buddy I was just mentioning, who I played in Pessimista with, is, that's his band that he ended up writing all the music for, and now I just play bass in it. Okay, well now when I kind of getting back to the beat thing, when I heard you doing the Stevie Wonder Pessimista thing, I was like, who the fuck is Pessimista? I can't yeah, wait to ask yeah. him who this is because I know you guys probably listen to some weird shit and shit like that I probably never heard of, but I was like, I don't know who the fuck that is, but. Sure. Um. So that that, yeah. that that explains that a little bit more, I guess. Yeah, that caption of that post that I was doing, I was like, please don't have me sample any of my own music. And my buddy found his way to work around it. So <laughs> well, it still sounded cool. Like, I don't the yeah. thing is, like, I've been listening to hip hop for like 30 years and I've never I don't just don't have the patience to sit down and like. Well, like press all the buttons and figure out how to do all of that shit. Like my son just got like a toy beat maker uh, for Christmas and I, I fuck around with that a little bit. And I'm like. I guess I could get one of those NPC things or whatever they're called and try to learn how to press all the buttons. But I just, I don't know. It's just, it seems like I heard one dude say years ago that it took him like six hours one time to find like the right horn or the right flute sound. And I'm like, dude, I'm not going to sit around for a whole day trying to find, you know what I mean? The beat probably sounds perfect after that, but it's like, Jesus Christ, you know? As someone who doesn't know anything about hip hop compared to the two of you, I like can't help but imagine what that was like in like the eighties for like the Beastie Boys or something. I don't know if you've you've both seen that Beastie Boys documentary, probably, but like, um, you know, like MCA was like a true visionary that he was like pulling all those samples without having the internet, without having like digital technology. So I mean, it's wild that it's 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 come as far as it has, and that it's as accessible it is as it is. Um, but I can't even fathom what that was like, you know, in like 1980. Yeah, like I said, that, I think that's kind of why I've never really tried because my mind with the technology is still kind of in the 80s, I think. Like, <laughs> I, I see all this new shit and I'm not like, I got to learn how to use half this shit. Like, I always feel like I end up getting caught up with shit like a couple years after it was like when it was relevant or whatever, you know, and I want to try and stay more on top of it now, but... It's the way my brain's always been with technology. So, um, but yeah, let's talk about the beats a little bit more, I guess, before we, we jump into hereditary too much. Um, so I know you got that, that I, I checked out your solo project you did too. Um, is that something that it really took you like a couple of years to put that all together? Or? The, uh, the rooftop remix one? Yeah. Yeah. No, that was, I mean, it's, it's kind of had like sprinkles of like beats that I made, like, just coming out of high school or whatever, like also just in COVID, like trapped in my bedroom. So some of those beats are like just picked from a plate, like a folder that I have of sessions that I never finished. But um, a lot of them too were just like recent ones too that I just had never finished. And it came to fruition because like I didn't really have, I don't really have any rapper friends, but I wish I had people to rap on my beats. So like all of those tracks are just like my favorite rappers, like. So their freestyles from the radio, just putting it on my beats and stuff. So it sounded coolest to me. So I put it out. Yeah, there. I recognize. I recognize most of the rappers on there. I'm pretty sure. I listened to it a couple times, and I was like, there, if, I, if there was a couple, I was like, I'm not sure if I know what that is. But most of them, I was like, I'm pretty sure I know those. Um, that's that's interesting though. You don't know. Are there, is there like no local rappers there, or are you just not t- t- tapped into that scene too much? Or yeah, I'm just I just haven't. I haven't tapped into that scene that much. Um, I think a lot of it too is just like a lot of people are doing different styles than I am too. Um, like the West Coast slide stuff is really popular down here if you're familiar with that sort of stuff. Um, not just not a lot of people that want to do like the style that I like. So, yeah, yeah, that's the same thing with with going. It's kind of similar to technology with rap. I've always kind of been stuck in like the '80s '90s vibe and like. I've always loved that shit. And like, I tried to kind of, you know, keep track of what was popular in the next couple decades. And I mean, obviously like Griselda and shit like that I'm into, but like an action Bronson, but like a lot of the more popular shit is just not really what I'm a huge fan of. I will say some of the more like, uh, what's that Chicago shit? What do they call that shit? Uh, the drill shit. Some of that shit is really authentic. And some of that shit that I've heard, I'm like, I don't really want to recommend it to people because they really legitimately are talking about people that they've like, <laughs> you know. Um, so, but when I listen to it, I'm like, there's nothing more authentic for like rap right now than that. Cause like those dudes like are talking about shit they've actually done. Like, you know, like some of the other shit I still like. And like, I've 
I've been kind of taking more time to try and research and find like more current up and coming like underground rap. Cause I feel like if there's thousands of hardcore bands, there's gotta be thousands of rappers out there. And at least some of them have to be doing, I feel like you're into some of the same shit. I'm with like the boom bap shit, right? Or sure, yeah. Yeah. So I feel like there's gotta be like, like some rappers out there doing that kind of shit. I just got to tap into them other than, I mean, obviously Griselda's doing it, you know? Sure. Yeah. Um, are you, so I guess if you don't like, do you just have beats, but you, you, you're just like sitting on them or like, is it just, you just make the project for the, the example thing you're doing or. Yeah. So that thing is just like a separate series I have going, but I, I try to make a couple or like a few beats every week. And, um, sometimes I finish them. Sometimes I don't. Um, and they all just kind of end up in that same folder. And then whenever I feel like putting a project out, I kind of just gather up what I've made put finishing touches on it and kind of just figure out where I want to go from there. All right. I guess, I guess we'll kind of jump in back into hereditary a little bit before you start wrapping things up. Um, the, like I said, obviously I, I really enjoyed the record last year. I know you guys had done a demo before that. Um, what, like what, what was the process between putting the, the EP together last year though? Like, did you guys know, like you had kind of, improved and written some shit that other people were going to like or were you just kind of like just put it out there and hoping people would enjoy it or yeah, you're talking about like the newest ep or the demo yeah the newest one yeah yeah um so we had already been sitting on the demo for a year and we kind of already had a right already like written a few tracks and um it was kind of just like why not drop it um we had a little bit of money saved up and we wanted to like record a proper thing um and I'm, I'm glad we did because the response has been great. So we're uh, super, super, uh, super stoked on the project. <laughs> yeah, that's four songs. And what I didn't realize, too, is, again, like kind of researching for this interview is the forever ending records. That's you, too, right? Right. Yeah. So is that you just like put all your stuff under that umbrella or like do you plan on releasing other stuff, too? Or Yeah, I've, uh, it's kind of just like a. DIY like cassette label right now. Um, I've put out a, a couple of my other friends' band stuff too, and I plan on doing more throughout the year. Um, coming close on like the 10th release now. Um, but yeah, it, it, it kind of just started as like, it's like an umbrella for like whether I wanted to do music or like just, just like a creative outlet, just like a, a unit for like things that I want to do, whether it's music or not. What uh? What are some of the bands on your label that people should check out that we might not have heard of that are like up and coming or or maybe just kind of local to San Diego? Sure. Um, this band got awful from the IE. Um, they're doing their thing right now. They just did their second press of tapes. Um, it's called. That's more of like the beatdown stuff that you get from like a lot of the IE scene up there. Super cool stuff. And then you got, um, I'm putting out my buddy's headstone. They're from down here. It's like, uh, like the, I want to say it's, it's straight up just heavy metal. It's, it's got like great synths and stuff. It's, it's really good stuff. And they play really well live. Um, let's see. Oh gosh. I feel like I should know. I'm on the spot now. <laughs> <laughs> um, my buddy's uh, in this band called New Aesthetic. It's like more pop punk stuff. Um, I put out their stuff earlier last year. Um, they're doing their thing right now, kind of doing everything they can in Southern California, which is super cool to see. Um, but besides that, my buddy's uh, Purist Bond. Um, they're putting out a promo, I think, later later this year. And then um, I think I did like a split with Purist Bond and another uh, band of my friends called the Schizoids, R.I.P., the purest bond they're like metalcore i think i saw them oh, when i was like lurking on your profile yeah yeah okay this all sounds very similar to a friend of ours from rochester jared who runs a sawyer collective it's very similar he has bands that he plays in and then he releases you know like short run releases of all of his friends stuff sometimes on cassette vinyl and stuff like that so it's cool to see that there's a lot of different local people doing like similar stuff for their friends bands like all across the country still you know what i mean Sure. Yeah. Um, but yeah, anything else coming up uh, with Hereditary for 2024? Any shows or anything else that we uh, anything else you're able to talk about or anything? Um, 
doing we're gonna do um a little weekend in northern california in february um looking to announce that soon and then I think we have that death before dishonor show coming up at the beginning of march it's gonna be super sick our first sos gig we're excited for that um but yeah we're still still getting shows booked i think we have one more to announce but i'm not sure if i should announce it because i don't know when we're planning on doing that Uh, Greg, you got any, any more questions about hereditary or anything before we start uh, doing the anything we missed type questions or anything? No, let's get into anything we missed. And then, of course, like right as we're wrapping up, I'll think of some like awesome question that I'll throw at you. All right. I feel like there's probably more stuff we could talk about hereditary, but is there anything that you can think of that we missed or anything, uh, Nate? Um, Nothing crazy. No, not, not that much going on. <laughs> All right, yeah, we'll put the track at the end of the episode so people can check that out if I haven't already hyped your guys' band up and up on my social medias over the last few months. Um, but, but yeah, I guess other than that, uh, if anything, any shout-outs you want to give or any plugs or anything like that, and we'll throw it in with the show notes too, obviously. Yes, I have several, and I wrote them down because I know I'd forget. <laughs> um, Undertone Records, shout-out to Undertone Records. Uh, True Colors, Brandon from Big Boy, Take Offense, obviously. Uh, Pure Spawn, Headstone, Intercom. Madrigado, Schizoids, Sledges, Homeview, uh, the label Forever Ending Records, Pops, Tattoos, and City Heights, Bare Minimum from the 805, they're sick, check them out, uh, Mongrel, they're doing their thing in San Diego right now, that's the homies, uh, Alex Jacobelli, who mixed our latest record, shit sounds incredible, we're stoked on it, my little brother Jacob, who this band Hereditary would not exist without, um, that is one thing that I guess I should have touched on. Uh, this is Jacob's first musical project ever. He hasn't ever been interested in doing this. And it was kind of like the same way that my older cousin brought me into this and was just like, you're going to do this and we're going to figure it out. Um, that last band that I was playing in Pessimista, I saw him moshing or whatever. And I was like, it's your turn to be a vocalist now. So <laughs> he, he the, the way the demo was created was I put him in a closet with my microphone and he just did it. And... <laughs> We had a first show in like January the next year, and we've just been figuring it out since. But oh yeah, I forgot about Abstain, San Diego Straight Edge. So that closet, that closet trick is like legit. There's like top tier podcasts that are like in the top ten of like Apple podcasts. That that is the studio they record in. It's just like a fucking closet a with like a closet. microphone they got from Best Buy, and it sounds it sounds good. Um, uh, so love that your brother's in the band too. I guess I didn't pick up on that. Um, I've always done bands with my younger brother. I like kind of got him into hardcore too. And it's like a real cool thing because then you've got someone to share this music with that's going to follow you through your lifetime. Like friends come and go, people have falling out, you reconnect with people, you know, that's all great stuff. But when you got like family involved, that makes it like uh, something that's next level. And then, um, of course, like I got him into hardcore. I do hardcore bands with him. I'm doing one right now, but then he started his own bands and they all got fucking way more popular than any band I've ever done. So hopefully that doesn't happen to you. Hey, I think it already has. This is his first project. I've done 10, brother. Yeah. <laughs> uh, any other shout outs? I feel like we should ask the shout out question uh, first next time. Oh God. Uh, did you, did you get through all the, did you get through your whole, uh, was there anybody else on there or anything? Or? Yeah, all, all 50 of them. I think I got them. All right. Shout All out right. to Over My Dead Body. Shout out to Mark Hoppus and Tom DeLong. Shout out to, uh, I don't know any other San, San Diego, Diego landmarks. Yeah, San Diego, Diego Padres. Padres. The Hardcore Archive podcast is Josh Lyons and Greg Benoit with creative support from Rob Antonucci. This podcast is a product of the Rochester Hardcore community. Theme song provided by Stand Fast. Visit Hardcore Archive podcast on Linktree to listen to past episodes. Follow Hardcore Archive Podcast and Enterprise Hardcore Podcast on Instagram for updates. If you have an idea for an episode or would like to have your band's music featured during the closing credits, please contact us at hardcorearchivepodcast at gmail.com.